Uh, we have three panelists and you, because you are the next generation of consumers. Do take a seat and the audience will applaud you in because they love you already. All right, let me tell you who we have. Meta Lerger is the CEO of Too Good To Go. Your typical consumer is who? Who are they? So for Too Good To Go, the typical consumer is someone who wants to help fight food waste. And we just heard about it. You know, more than a third of all food in this world is wasted, and we think it's insane. And there are no particularly good reasons for it. It's just complicated. So we've basically built a marketplace for the food that would otherwise go to waste. So we have a free app where our consumers go in and they download and they can see what their favorite restaurant or bakery nearby has of surplus food and they, and they can buy that at a discount. Stefan Gotthardt is the managing director of Colorate Group Fine Food and Retail Services. Had you heard of Too Good To Go? Yes, I did. Actually, we do work a little bit together. Uh -huh. uh, since a couple of months now, it's a very very interesting initiative. Um, food waste is also on our agenda, uh, but the way we are doing it mainly is by trying to avoid food waste. Uh, we're a big retailer, the largest one in Belgium, so we have a lot of products, a lot of food, and we try to limit the food waste as much as we can. We just saw a number, if I remember well, 30% of food waste in the retail. We're below 3%, so just to say it's really high on our agenda. Typical consumer is who? What are they like? Describe them. I think it could be anyone in this room, because we're having about 35% of market share, and we have different types of formulas, retail formulas, so it uh, could really be anyone. Rob Hammer is the VP of Agri-Food External Affairs Unilever. Rob, your typical consumer, in, let's keep it in Europe, because you have consumers all over the world. Yeah, we do, so, so we don't have a typical consumer. Mm. Uh, we would be out of business if we would have a typical consumer. Mm. But, but let me say this, I think we, we are consumer goods company, so we, we pay great care to follow trends also in, in changes in the consumer. And we do see, and as, as perhaps more than um, a few people in this audience see, that there is an aging population in Europe. There are more single uh, person households in Europe. The situation is also far more that people work hard, have less time to prepare a meal. Um, at the same time, people want to have honest and healthy and affordable food. Uh, but they also, because of all these reasons, look for convenience. So what we focus on is to really cater to those needs, to make it easy, and to also help inform the consumer, allowing the consumer to make what I call well-informed choices, uh, not only uh, in view of their own health, but also in view of our planet. Because we believe that a healthy consumer parallels a healthy planet. Meta, ask Rob a question. Ask Rob a question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Only so. one? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I can ask you a question. In Denmark, we've actually worked with uh, Unilever. Right. So, uh, so in Denmark, we've done a big campaign because our whole mission is to inspire and empower everyone to take action against food waste. And we looked into date labeling as, uh, as one cause of a lot of food waste unnecessarily. Uh, and we actually got Unilever to change some of their date labeling. So on some products, it's going to say best before, often good after, because that is really what best before means. Uh, so is that something that could be interesting uh, in other countries for you? Absolutely. Uh, there are even products that don't need a label at all. <laughs> uh, and, and we know from research that you can reduce waste of those products by 30% just by removing the label. Yeah. Yeah? Um, I take it like this, and perhaps that's also a nice message for you to take home. So if I talk about a well-informed consumer, it's also a consumer in my mind that knows when to throw away food or when they can still use it because it's good for consumption. And my statement would be that they are not. And to help them, uh, just a comparison, the risk of getting ill from a food product that is, let's say, well stored, but one day after the best before date, is 10,000 times smaller than hitting a camel when driving your car in The Hague at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so so it's, it's really allowing the consumer to think about risk rather than danger. Mm. And, and that's a lot of work still to do, because a lot of the media only report danger and not risk. Yeah. Yeah. So we can improve it by just Absolutely. adding those three words. People suddenly understand it, because most consumers confuse it with use by, which yes. is a date you should take quite seriously. 
So our conversation is about the next generation of consumer. Uh, uh, Stefan, I know that you are challenging consumers in the Belgian market, challenging what is done and how things are done. Do you want to share some of that story for us? Challenging the, the, the farmers in the, the agriculture culture, you mean? Mm. Yeah, we, we have done some, um, some, some tests. Um, in Belgium, we're big, and a re as a retailer, we often get into the picture when there are issues uh, from an agricultural perspective, whether it's the, the milk prices or whether it's the, the um, meat production. And um, that's OK. We want to take our social res responsibility. But what we are trying to do is come up with some solutions to, to, um, to improve the situation. Um, like, for instance, and that was quite new for the, the Belgian market a couple of months ago, uh, we had about 450 dairy farmers together, and we told them that we would, if they were interested, launch the idea of giving them a fixed price for the coming five years uh, for a certain volume of their milk. Because we know it's a, there is a lot of volatility in the milk prices. We cannot solve that. And of course, what we are doing is just, just a little test and trying to bring something to the, to, the, to the market, to the economy, to the, to the agricultural culture. And they participated, more than 300 participated to the idea that for the coming five years, they will have, at least for a certain volume, a fixed price. Of course, then you can start arguing, what about the price? Is it high enough? Shouldn't be higher? Uh, what we took as a reference was the average price of the last five years and put it a little bit higher. And that gives some, some air, we think, we believe, to the farmers for a certain uh, volume and so also for a certain amount of their income. And we've been doing a couple of tests in that direction, hoping that we can make a little difference in the relation between retailers and the farmers. Too good to go. Talk us through it, Meta, because it's such a simple idea, and it's cheaper for the consumer, and it saves waste. So tell the audience how it works. Yeah, so, so basically, Too Good To Go connects supermarkets, bakeries, restaurants that have surplus food left by end of business with the consumers, on the other hand, who save this food by buying it at a discount, and then they go pick it up at the time of closing. And uh, so we've, we've created this marketplace where we try and solve food waste on market terms and make a case, a business case out of it as well, in addition to the mission and the CSR aspect. So we have, uh, we're live now in 10 countries across Europe. We have 9 million consumers on the platform. That's one side of it. And then we have 18,000 businesses and this cover any type of food business you can and, uh, think to, of. To what extent does that interfere with food banks? Because I'm sorry? To what extent does that compete or interfere with food banks? Uh, it doesn't really, because this is typically food that the food banks are not interested in. Okay. So say, for example, you have a bakery and you throw out you know, two big bags of food every day. The logistics for a food bank in driving around right. town to pick right. that up, it doesn't make sense. So this is like the, the long tail of food waste. It's the last one or two or three percent in a supermarket, and it's the, it's the food that has a really high turnover, uh, where you know, we solve the logistics because consumers come and pick it up themselves. Right. Okay. Good. Um, Very good. Mm? And we've saved a little more than uh, 12 million meals to date uh, from going to waste. So you've already scaled up. If you've got 9 million users, that's already scaled up. And Stefan, go ahead. Yeah, uh, a question I asked, and I want to repeat it for the audience. Uh, I would think that consumers, when they know the, the system, they start planning it. Yeah. When yes. They know when I go to that store, be there at 5, and then I can yeah. get some opportunities. Yeah. So this, so this is the cannibalization concern that we hear from a lot of our stores. It's not actually an issue. And the reason is that we've invented what we call a magic bag. Because food waste is unpredictable, you know, if, if you were a baker and you knew what you would have left by end of business, I'd like to think you would stop producing it, right? It's unpredictable, you really don't know. And that's why we've invented the magic bag. It gives the store flexibility to just put in the bag whatever is left on that day. And as a consumer, you understand that, you know, I love this bakery, I'm gonna get a mix of bread and cake from them, and then I'm happy. I know what the monetary value is going to be, and then I'm happy. And it's very hard as a consumer to plan for something when you don't know what you're going to get. 
So the cannibalization is not really an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stefan, is that convincing? It is. Um, yeah. It, it is, is convincing. Because it I, is. Uh, it's convincing, uh, right? Uh, uh, Come you on, guys. Not sounding, <laughs> you told me yesterday, you so are not I'm sounding still... like you're convinced. <laughs> no, no, There's no. a couple of pauses gave you away. I, I see what you mean. I, no. would, I love a bargain. I would just wait and no. eat whatever was in the 75% the off bin. No. I would definitely do that and then change what I was going to cook that night. No. And there's another caveat, which is we may cancel on you. Because it's food waste, Stefan may end up selling it at full price, and congratulations, but then we're going to cancel your meal. And that's just the nature of it. And our consumers get it, and it's fine. When I'm hesitating, it's because I'm always interested in seeing how customers are really going to behave, consumers. And it may be different in, from one country to another. Um, talked about uh, meat consumption uh, earlier today. Um, there is a, a really trend to more vegetarian and vegan, for instance, if you go more up north in Europe. It's not actually the same in Belgium or if you go to France. So I'm just curious, and that's why we are starting some tests at one of our retail formulas and see what, what's going to bring. Rob, from Unilever's perspective, what a, this is such an innovative idea. It seems so obvious. I'm, I'm shocked that it hasn't been done more, although chefs have started to do this with restaurants set up from food waste from supermarkets, so we're seeing it more and more being rolled out. As far as Unilever's concerned, what are you doing that's the most innovative in this arena regarding your consumers? What are you proudest to tell people about? Well, well how much time do I have? Yeah? So, so in, the, in that sense, no, I'm, I, I'm just, just focusing on, on food waste. I mm -hmm. think it's, it's and so we, we, I was just listening in and said, well, we need to produce so much more food. And at the same time, you, two slides further on, you hear that we waste so much food. Uh, they added up to 40%. Yeah. So I think, I think the world really has to sort of reset. And we have to reset the system to such an extent that we don't waste food, that we use 100% of every agricultural crop, that we don't refuse uh, cabbages because they are a bit off color, things like that. Yeah, so that we really start treating food and adding the value to food that it deserves. That's, that's a very important point. For, for us as a, so we, we are in, in, a, in a global business. We are in the shelf-stable product, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and again, we, we would find it a, a terrible waste if people don't use our product. So one of the innovations that uh, sounds simple, but, but many people in the audience have tried to get the product out of the bottle, you know, with mayonnaise or ketchup. So one of our small innovations is uh, what we call easy out leading that you can really get out about 98% of the product instead of the 90% before. So that's a big saver on food waste at the same time. But I also hope that consumers appreciate that they really can get more out of our packages. They paid for it, yeah? Did you have like a scientist working for 10 years to find out how to get more ketchup out of a bottle? <laughs> well, at first, no. Uh, interesting uh, R&D project. Well, well, the interesting, well, this is philosophy R&D, yeah? All right. So the philosophy about R&D is that you first pose the right question. As yeah. soon as we pose the question, we have the answer in a minute. What was the question? The question is, how do you get more out of the bottle? <laughs> okay. So, no, seriously, I, 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 this is a serious point because we often don't see and uh, are not aware, sufficiently aware, of how much food we basically waste just by rethinking that. Mm. There could be easy solutions. Your solution, mm. come on, it's like a no-brainer if you come to think of it, yeah? But it's a wonderful solution. You really should be applauded for it. And, and I think there are many other solutions that are still out there that are waiting to be used as soon as we start posing the right question. The thing, the thing about food waste is it's such a massive issue and it's so complicated because there's so many actors and processes involved that we need thousands of solutions. I think we're only getting started now, but we need a can lot of different. And some of them may appear small. Can I give you another example? Not a Unilever example, just another example to show. So if you have broccoli, you know, a lot of people when they prepare broccoli themselves, they, they cut away the stems, the thick parts. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. This is not because you can't eat it. Yeah, it's, it's healthy, it contains lots of nutrients. Now I know a small company in the Netherlands that takes those parts, turns them into small grains, and sells them for salads. Sometimes the, the ask for the, his product is so big that he puts in the whole broccoli, you know? So, so it's rethinking things, really looking at our food in terms of, can I really consume it all? Yeah. What do they call these stalks of broccoli when they resell them? 
I think they just call them broccoli grains. Okay. It's very hipster-like, actually, isn't it? It's absolutely it's like what your grandmother used to cook, we're now buying in a separate little packet, and we're That's paying cool, more it. for it. <laughs> Meta, I know you had something to ask the audience. Go for it. Okay. Do, do, do you need the lights up? Yeah, let's have right, the lights. Lights up. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, so I think um, food waste is also caused by us losing the respect a little bit for the food. So I'm just curious, how many here grew up in a household or in a home where your parents told you to eat up what's on the plate? You know? Yeah? A lot of us, right? Do you guys pass that on to your children, if you have any? Yeah, some of you do. I th and I think we, I mean, and that's really what it's all about, understanding that food is a valuable resource and we have to respect it. And I think we're, because it's basically, you know, with this abundance of food, it's, it's almost all you can eat three times a day, what we're practicing. And we kind of forgot about it a little bit. Yeah, so, so this forgetting part, so this is what I mean with, in fact, it's all about re-enabling the consumer. We can do things, but we, basically the consumer also has a role to play. Let, let me give you an example. We, put on our, we, we sell about 50 million of these meal kits, and we, we put on the back of these kits uh, recipe suggestions, also for a vegetarian recipe. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we now know that 60% of consumers one or more times uses that recipe. Can you imagine the impact? Next step is that we want to reduce portion sizes. Uh, really follow dietary guidelines and say, well, why, why do we put 100 grams of meat per person on a pack? Well, when it is even better from a nutritional perspective to go to 75. Yeah? So in that sense, I think we also, as a, co as a consumer-facing company, can help and assist our consumers in, in getting to this level where they really start thinking diet, lifestyle, life stage, and the optimal combination. Yeah? Why do you care? This is for, for all of the panel. Why do you care what the consumers eat, as long as they're eating your product? Well, that's a very simple business question. Because, in fact, what we like is that our consumers prosper, that they become citizens, that they can earn more money, that they can even buy our more expensive products. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's a win-win situation. I think we, we don't, we're very open. I mean, the consumer finally is going to decide what he wants to eat, so we need a, a very broad offering. Um, but what is important today that if a customer is, is looking for his products today, he needs to have information. And I think information, you can put it on the product. That is one way to do it. You can put information online. Yeah. Um, but if we're talking about food waste, I think we mentioned it earlier also, there's about 25% of food that a consumer is going to throw away. Um, I think we can do even more there. We, we have a Colorado Group Academy, what is what it's called. Uh, it's an academy where we give all kinds of workshops. And one of the most popular workshops is cooking with leftovers. Mm. I think that's another thing to solve the, uh, the issue of uh, yep. food waste. Absolutely. Have you been to this workshop? I have not. Done myself. Okay. I'm not cooking that much myself. I've, I've been. I, I see <laughs> you are talking the talk. Yeah. Let's get to a question. Will the next generation value food more, less, or the same as today? Meta, you start. Yeah. So, so I think it's very interesting how we see right now that the young generation is really standing up for the climate. The, the one thing that makes me a little concerned is I am not sure they fully connect food waste with the climate. I'm not actually sure they understand that connection. And food waste is responsible for 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions. You know, not, not food, but food waste alone. And I just wish we could help more people and more young people become aware that, uh, that this is the case, because I'm not sure they understand fully. I think the, the climate is just one part of the answer. It's also about animal welfare, for instance. It's also about the societal impact and, and most, of, most importantly, uh, a consumer is uh, really concerned about his health. He wants to know what is best for his particular condition today and tomorrow can be different. So I think it's even more complex than just the climate. And I think we have collectively failed if we are not able to help the next generation understand that they have to value food much more than they do today. Have you seen any examples of that? 
we, we do see that, uh, well, you see that with the millennials that, that are choosing more the vegetarian diet, about 40%, if I'm to believe the numbers. So that, that, that uh, also the awareness of indeed um, the, the climate aspects, uh, the ability that by means of your food choices, you can do something good for the planet as well. Yeah? Uh, so yes, I do see very promising examples of that. Yeah. This is from Peter at Ghent University. And this is a fighting question, actually. There's no unhealthy food. There are unhealthy food consumption patterns, like food processing. Why do you think consumers would pay more for sustainably produced food? That's an assumption that you think they would. So let's start with that. Yeah. I'm not convinced consumers today are, they, they do care about the sustainability. I'm not convinced that they really are prepared to pay more for it. I'm not always convinced it needs to cost more, neither. I think by bringing a lot of experts together and, and also not, not only within, within the retailer or within the uh, groups like um, Unilever, um, I think we need to work closer together and come up with solutions. And I don't believe it always needs to cost more. Well, in fact, I think sustainable food should become the new normal. We can't, that, that's the only way, basically. And I'm very pleased uh, with Peter that he basically says there's no unhealthy food because people are programmed these days that there is unhealthy food products, etc. No, it's all about diet, lifestyle, and life stage. And that's, again, something that is perhaps a, a bit more difficult to grasp and communicate, but it's very key yeah? uh, in, in really getting this, balanced, uh, this balance right between your diet and lifestyle and, and your age, basically, and your requirements. Yeah, but if we're talking about unhealthy food, there is, of course, the issue about with sugar and salt and fats. I think what we've been doing in, in Belgium and some countries as well with the, the Nutri-Score, for instance, to, to give some tools to the consumer to have very quickly information about the product, I think that, will, that is valuable as but well. But then again, Nutri-Score is, is, let's say, I don't think that score or any other score can already live up to the standards that we require from a good front of pack uh, scoring system. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I dare you to, to calculate the Nutri-score of a pizza shawarma. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But which, which every system has its advantages and its disadvantages. Yeah, the but thing is that a consumer today, it takes about four <coughs> seconds to, to make a decision. And in those four seconds, he needs to choose the product, maybe the flavor, the way, the way he needs to cook it, uh, whether it's okay for his, himself, but also for his children. It's a lot of information he needs to process in a very short time. So we need to come up with some tools that makes it easy. And it's not going to be perfect. I know the Nutri score is not perfect. But at least it's, it's a tool that makes it a little bit easier. But bef before we sort of push one or the other, I would really recommend that we do some thinking and uh, huh? create something that also, for example, leads to what I would say uh, composing the healthy diet. Also, let's, let's have standards in terms of portion sizes, for example, which would be helpful for the consumer as well in really making, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, more healthy uh, choices in that how, sense. How do you do portion sizes if people are just going shopping? It's very confusing because there's no standard of what a portion is. Mm. So, so you say, oh, there's one portion, and another pack says that's another portion. Yeah. But the, we don't have a standard yet. So let's stop confusing the consumer. That's my goal. So what is that, a European standard, a global standard for what a portion is? Ideally, uh, <laughs> well, we all know that portion sizes in certain parts of the world are much bigger than, than here, but um, hmm. no, I, I, I rather... Keep me thinking of? Let's start with Europe first. Yes, yeah. yeah. Meta, this idea, and just to go back on Peter's question about the idea of will people pay more for sustainably produced food? I think, especially in Scandinavia, the organic trend over the past 10 years has really been quite massive. Um, so I think that's an example of people being willing to do that. That said, I think you know, healthy, nutritious food should be cheaper versus junk food. I think that ratio today is completely off. Mm -hmm. Let's go to our consumers in the audience, which is everybody. Uh, put your hands up if you've got a question. The microphones will come to you. Oh, okay, lots, lots, a little, little gaggle down here. Oh, one right up here. You come right to the front, this gentleman right here. Let's, oh, and then another one over there. Great, we will remember you. I won't forget you. All right. <laughs> Okay, let's start over here. Who are you and what is your question? Me. Oh. Hello. Hi, I'm, Hi. Sa I'm Saki Morita and I'm a uni bachelor university student, first year studying agribusiness. And 
I'm interested in food waste. I think earlier today there was also a talk about food waste and how the price of the food is too low for consumers to have respect for the food. And I'm wondering, first of all, what your companies do to tackle this problem of balance with price and the food waste and what you think the industry is doing to tackle the problem. And I'm sure, third of all, I'm sure that there are some companies that promote their products as being cheap and how, you, how your companies overcome the, those other companies who promote their products as cheap to promote sustainability in the consumers. Who wants to start? Meta, do you yeah, want to start? I can start. So I think the first question was how to get that respect into the consumer's mindset. So I can talk a little bit about how we work with that. So, uh, so we've started out with this free app, and then on top of that, we want to help build the movement against food waste. So when we, when we define what does it mean to start a movement and join the movement already going on, we have kind of defined four pillars. So we want to help businesses think differently. And one example is the Unilever date labeling we've done in at least one country now. Uh, and the other one is just to consumers, to give them the tips and tricks, because it's actually pretty small tweaks you need to make in your everyday life to change something. And then we have an educational pillar, where so far we've worked with more than 50 schools, uh, and we educate and teach kids about food waste, and we combine it with entrepreneurship and innovation because we also have an interesting company for a lot of young people. So all the way from fourth grade to university, we offer learning material for teachers and students, and we support them if they want to write about us or do something with us. So we have a, a team assigned just to do that and inspiring kids that way. And then we have our political agenda where we would like to address some of the legislative things that you know, creates food waste instead of reducing it. Stefan. Yeah, as a retailer, of course, we are always in the picture when it comes to prices. Um, we have several types of formulas, and I think the, the more premium ones are not the ones that are really uh, an issue. It's the, the one where we guarantee the lowest price. Mm -hmm. uh, I get that question very often. Uh, doesn't that have an impact and, and it decrease the price? Actually, what we are doing is we're, we're following the market, and for some products, um, there's a, a more local market, a national market. For some products, it's really international. And we're in Belgium, so we're rather small. Um, and we're following the price. So if anyone lowers his price, we're going to follow. We're never going to set a price. Oh, but ho but, hold that thought, yeah. because there's a question here that's exactly speaking to that. For the representative of Colorado, Mm -hmm. Stefan, how do you plan to deal with sudden changes in the market price when talking about fixing a price for the farmers, producers? That you were yeah. pretty much answering that question as you were speaking. Go ahead. Yeah, because what we try to do is understand the entire value chain and then see where in that chain we can bring some added value. Um, for instance, with the milk, the example that I told, talked about before, we know there is an issue regarding the, the price for the farmer. Uh, it, I must admit, it's a little bit of a risk. Um, maybe in a couple of years, I will say, we failed. Could you but lose money? Yeah, we yeah. could, yeah. yeah. But if nobody moves and we're only continue to talk and, and argue and discuss, then nothing is going to change. Right. But we believe that it's a good price because it covers the costs of everyone in the entire chain. So actually, that's the price it should be. Did the farmers think it's a good price too? Yeah, because uh, almost 80% of them subscribe to the project, so I think they, uh, All right. they agree. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, Eddie Punch from the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association. Isn't the problem that consumers have been conditioned by multinational retailers to believe that food should be ever cheaper? So that chewing gum is now, for example, more expensive than some cheap burgers. And as a consequence of that, food waste is inevitable. And isn't it time that the regulatory authorities at EU level or at global level started insisting on more transparency over the way in which the price of food is dictated by multinational corporations where there is no transparency about who gets what margin from the food chain? And I can speak to this and say that our members beef and lamb producers in Ireland are losing money heavily in the production 
of quality, sustainable beef and lamb at this moment? I think transparency is really key, and that's exactly what we try to do by working together with the farmers and paying them directly and make everything in between, if we're talking about meat, if everything in between, make it a service so that the farmers knows very transparently how much he's going to get for his product, how much cost there's going to be for the, the slaughtering of the, the animals, for instance, um, and at what price it's going to be sold at a retailer. So it's very transparent. Again, it's a test. I'm not sure it's going to work, but at least we're trying. I have a follow-up question for you, for your question. You're losing money. What do you do about that? Well, all of the power is in the hand of the multinational retailers. And we think that at EU level, for example, we should have compulsory audits of the food chain to demonstrate exactly who's making money out of it and also to shine a light on practices where you get two chickens for the price of one. You can't have animal welfare and sustainability in environmental terms when that kind of shady practice goes on or where, you know, carrots are so cheap now that there is no more than a handful of vegetable producers left in Ireland. And the beef sector is in danger of going the same way. So we can't just allow something as important as food to depend on maybe good initiatives like your, your business, when in fact certain retailers from, let's say, a very large country in Europe are leading the charge in making food ever cheaper to consumers who can afford to pay a little bit more. And in a way which is putting our farmers out of business such that common agricultural policy supports are less and less effective in, in ensuring that they can make a living. So basically people want to eat cheap rather than they want to be sustainable. It seems to be the case. And we now have the absurd scenario that some people are advocating a carbon tax on food consumption, which is crazy. Just pay the farmers a decent price. Rob. You've got interesting views about the... <laughs> Good afternoon, farmers. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's why I had a few follow-up questions, because I knew you were here. All right. Uh, you've got interesting views, Rob, on the consumer. How well-educated are they? Be candid. I think only uh, a very small proportion of the consumer still knows what they're talking about. If it's about uh, food and health, for example, or food and sustainability, or food preparation even. Uh, we just, we're talking about the practice of uh, knowing how to use uh, leftovers to prepare a meal. I know my mother knew that. She was teaching basically um, children how to do that at a cookery school. Um, so you do that basically every Saturday. You just get all your leftovers and, and prepare a good meal with them. How many consumers still know about yeah. that? So, when, uh, when I grew up when I was a little girl in the UK, there was something called bubble and squeak, and it was basically all the leftover vegetables right. and potato, right. and you just shove it in exactly. a pan. So, and and th there must be versions of that all over the world, but do you think we're not doing that anymore? Not enough by far. In the, some regions of the world, we do absolutely. Yeah? Let's, let's be fair about that. Actually, the developing world is probably teach, could teach us in the developed world exactly, some lessons. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, the, uh, but, but I was just thinking about the, the question that was posed uh, earlier about the value of food versus throwing it away. I can't believe there's anybody that doesn't feel a bit ashamed in, when throwing away food. I think it's more the problem that they don't know whether it's safe, yes or no or don't know how to, to prepare it in a decent way. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is where we can help them. Uh, I, I personally would like to advocate that we really raise the level of, of, of appreciation for food uh, throughout society, even, even let's say, uh, healthcare professionals. The average medical doctor in the Netherlands has had one day of training in his whole training period of, what is it, five, six years, about food and, and, and nutrition. Yeah? There's now so many data around that proper nutrition will help you uh, increase the success of a, of a hospital, uh, of an operation, yeah. will decrease the amount of day, days, etc. So can help cancer patients uh, cope with their treatment, etc. So I really make a, a plea for a, an increased awareness of the importance of food. And I think if we start talking about food as a value much more than we do today, 
I think a number of, of the problems that we are facing, having a fair price, not wasting it, are basically becoming much more easy to accept by the consumer. Yeah? Stefan, what were you saying? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I really believe uh, that's, that's correct. Um, we call it internally food as a medicine. I think it's, uh, it's something that is going to be more and more important for the coming years. Uh, but then you need to know, of course, what are the ingredients, what are the components, what are, yeah. So we need to better educate and give a lot more very correct data to, uh, exactly, to consumers. Exactly, correct data, yeah. Mm. Meta, have you ever paid full price for food since you started your app? Excuse me? Do you, have you ever paid full price for food since you started your app? I have, yes. You have? I have. Why, was the app down? <laughs> <laughs> the app was <laughs> down. So the thing is, uh, most, of our, uh, most of our stores, you know, they, they deliver the food out at time of closing, which means unless you want to go hungry until uh, 5 or 6 o'clock, oh, you know, okay. we're, not, we're not fully there yet. It helps with the hotels and their morning buffets, but, uh, but uh, it's mainly in the evening. Uh, so our consumers are typically young parents, uh, middle-aged women and uh, students. Mm. Mm. All right, still on the consumer idea here. This is from Nathan at the University of Ghent. So they're either here in the room or they're watching online. So thanks for that. How can we better educate the consumer to become more eco-conscious? This idea that they know more, they understand more. I know, Matthew, you were talking about getting the kids at, when they're mm. young at school. We've got the waste food workshops and cooking uh, courses. But we also what know that, uh, that recipe sites are very popular. Okay. Uh, very um, often visited by consumers. They also like to exchange recipes and, uh, and, and really build the discourse about uh, how to deal with certain recipes. So I think, I think that there's lots to be gained in, in those, using those platforms. Uh, but yes, overall, there needs to be education or what I call information that, that is reliable and, and trustworthy. Yeah. Uh, rather than uh, information that is set out to scare uh, consumers away. Yeah. It is very complicated to know the ecological impact. Uh, we've been working with uh, the European uh, Commission regarding the uh, organizational environmental footprint and the product environmental footprint. It's been uh, launched uh, last year. Um, and we've been trying to come up with some tests to um, calculate the product environmental footprint of a couple of products. It's extremely complicated because you need to have, again, very good uh, data uh, of the entire chain. And it's changing every day on top of that. So it's, uh, it's complicated, but I, th I think it's really worthwhile make, starting to make those steps and, and trying to come up with good information about the ecological impact. And it's more than about climate. It's, uh, yeah. it's about 16, I think, uh, impact categories. It's about biodiversity and stuff like that. So it's, it's really complicated. Thank you for patiently waiting. Go ahead. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Ting Ming Rao. I'm from China. I have the same education background with Saki. And I'll keep my question short and simple. Why can't I find Too Good To Go on the Chinese App Store? It's <laughs> <laughs> an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so uh, we, you know, we're, with Too Good To Go, we're tackling a, a universal problem, and so far, at least, we think we have a universal solution. But you know, one thing at a time. So for now, we're focused on Europe. We just launched Italy two weeks ago. Uh, we have uh, another country coming up in May, and we have another one coming up this summer. Uh, so I think by the end of the year, we are probably ready to see uh, what continent is next, whether that's Asia or something else is uh, too, too soon to tell. But uh, I'm fully aware there's a need out there as well. Meta, when are you going to be a billionaire? How far away oh. are you? <laughs> We're quite far away. All right. We're quite far away. Wouldn't, um, wouldn't that be amazing that you become a billionaire from selling old food? You know, it's, uh, you know I, we, we're really focused on the mission that we have. Sure. You know, and I've been an entrepreneur for a long time, and I had, I've had my success with it. Mm -hmm. So this, for me, is not about that whole aspect. Yeah. This is about the mission and the impact we can have. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Ricardo Serra. I am a farmer in the south of Spain, and I grow potatoes, orange, and vegetables. And my question is, what happens with this that we waste just during the harvest, just in land? 
sometimes more than 25% of what we produce because uh, the consumers demand uh, products in pollutants. Must, must be wonderful and we, wait, we waste more than 25%, 30% of our products. Don't you have a, a solution for this? I, I would. So you, so you mean basically between the farm and the retailer or the farm and the, the primary producer? No, just in the land during the harvest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, on the house, okay, yeah. Okay. Because it must be in pollutants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, for example, in the Netherlands... And, and the, the official reason is because the, the, the consumers demand that must be exactly uh, without anything, no, uh, no it fair. Can't, it can't be ugly. It has to look nice enough to put in the stores. So, I, I understand exactly what so, you're saying. So, so yeah. uh, I understand it too. It's, it's uh, absolutely, I see it as an opportunity that we have to grab. And when I talk about 100% use, so total use of agricultural crop, that includes the, exactly the topic that you're addressing. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, we took the initiative with a number of other companies to, to start working out our ways of really using it, whether it's onions or, or other agricultural crops, to really say, what do we need to do differently in order to make full use of that ag agricultural raw material? because I think it's uh, too good to go, to be honest. Uh, so so we, we really need to um, use that as well. We may need to rethink, and that's another important point, we may need to rethink the way we are used to process foods or the way we set criteria. Last summer, uh, we had a very uh, dry summer, as you know. The plums were just one millimeter in diameter too small and didn't com comply to specs from retail. Well, fortunately, they solved that. But we need to stay, again, we need to revisit that, yeah? Because we will get more hot summers. We will we'll get more problems. We, we are, are absolutely sure about that, yeah? But I, but I think to fix that, we also need a commitment from the farmers. Because, I mean, sometimes when we talk to farmers, because we definitely acknowledge this, what they tell us is, you know, the way they work, and maybe that doesn't go for you guys, but they go harvest once and they take all the great stuff. And then it, the, the economics of then going out a second time doesn't really make sense, and then they just let it be. So, you know, to really fix that, I think we need a commitment uh, among several actors to, uh, to actually yeah. go for it and, you know, harvest everything, and then we can sort it after. But uh, I don't know if that commitment is there. And, and maybe a delicate comments, and then if it's so, I will leave the stage. But I think it's also <laughs> important that we, we have a balance between offer and demand. I mean, last year we saw the, the potatoes. Uh, we had lots of potatoes, and, and there were so many potatoes left on the land that all the neighbors could just have free potatoes. And, and this year it's a different story, and they're, they're smaller calibers. And um, now of course, I know that if you're in an in a industry like the potato industry, the climate you, you cannot predict the climate. So we'll have to we have to work together and, and, and talk to each other. But in some industries, we can balance it a little bit better. If we're talking about milk production, for instance we can balance a lot better what we need. Here's a question for you, Meta. What do you do with the food waste that you don't manage to sell? That comes from Claudia, who's in Amsterdam. Yeah, so, uh, so that unfortunately is wasted with our partners. So we have, some, we have a, a, a KPI that we follow notoriously every day and we call it the saved ratio. So it's basically of all the meals put on our platform, how large a share of them do we actually find a stomach for, or a consumer for? Uh, and that's a number that has been climbing from, uh, from around 25% to, uh, to around 80% now, meaning eight out of 10 meals actually do get saved. And there are variations by country, and of course a new country will drag it down because it takes a while to build the demand side, but it's something that we are very, very, um, uh, very, very careful of constantly improving. I just want to scan the room again. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, lots. Okay. Who's got a microphone? Stand I, up if you have a microphone. Yeah. Okay, great. So, my name is Felipe. I'm talking again here, but uh, anyway. So, my question, I think, is like we're talking about a lot of challenges on food waste and food loss, and yeah, so it's, we're creating actually like a fear-based culture. People are afraid of flying. People are afraid of having children. People are afraid about like emissions. 
uh, why we are actually not thinking about solving the bottleneck, the root cause of all these challenges, which is literally the root, is in the soil. Why we're not talking about shifting our ways of producing our major commodities, which is being used in all landscapes around the world, that we can do that by accumulating the most necessity of human being, which is the sunlight. Why we're not doing efficient use of sunlight. If we produce a diversified crop systems, agroforestry systems, which you can use the much of the sunlight, we can create abundance of resource. We can actually feed 16 billion people by 2050, and not only 9 billion. And there's scientific data behind, but there's not much support. So my question is, why we're not talking about soil and we're talking about these problems, which is just postponing what we actually are always talking about, decreasing the negative impact, using less this, using less that, instead of creating like an abundant mindset, so we can have enough resource, so we don't have to fear always in this future. Thank you. I'm just going to intervene and say this is a very diverse conversation. We have lots of people from different sectors talking about how they are helping the next generation of consumers. So you may not get that answer from this particular panel. Panel, any thoughts? I have a simple, uh, of course we need to do that. So who's telling you that we don't want to do that? Yeah, I, think, I think it's firing all cylinders, as we say. So also in Europe, we have big problems with erosion, with uh, compaction of soil with uh, basically exhaust, uh, exhaustion of soil. So a healthy soil is, is the basis for a future anyway. So when we talk about sustainable farming practices, and Unilever is, is very active in that area, globally, uh, we talk about teaching and working together with smallholder farmers in order to teach them how to do that. Uh, and, and by far, we can't do enough as we speak. So, so yes, uh, totally right. But then again, pro uh, as you say, we can perhaps up the production, but at the same time, I would still argue that losing part of the harvest and, and combating basically spoil it, of spills by the, by the consumer is still as relevant as it is today. Because we also know that, that climatic conditions will have a profound impact on, on the yeah, food security in general. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Dirk Wascher from Swiss Metro. I just wanted to react to the uh, remark before from uh, the Spanish colleague and also to Mette. Um, regarding the uh, left to the rest streams, we call them rest streams and not waste streams, from agricultural production, there is actually an interact project going on called BIVAC, B-I-V-A-C, which is focusing only on these rest streams from uh, harvest and leftovers and whole basically crop leftovers to turn into higher value chains for, let's say, uh, cosmetics, for um, um, basically taste, flavors, like um, uh, strawberries, etc. And the company which is doing this is uh, Fighter World, for example, and there can be uh, high value chains which are really of, there's an enormous market for. And the same accounts also what you said for the leftovers. Um, there is, for example, the insect industry, which is now slowly coming up. Protex uh, in the Netherlands is uh, looking, is now engaged in projects to find organic rest streams like the leftovers you just mentioned in order to then feed them to the uh, insects and to grow basically the protein for um, fish uh, uh, fodder. Yes, yeah, so I think this, uh, there are already things going on in this whole context. Thank you for that contribution. There was a little group of questions there. Who has the microphone? Hello. So, hello, um, Monica Mateo from Science Business. This question is mainly for Rob, but also for Stefan. When we talk about the next generation of consumers, uh, do you see a trend towards personalized nutrition? And what are your companies um, doing in, in terms of tackling this challenge? Yeah, f first of all, um, um, I think the key is that, that the future consumer will be basically this, working with us rather than being uh, the receiver of what we produce. And so in, in contact with the consumer, we like to find out how we can best support the consumer in these, what I call, well-informed choices. Um, personalized nutrition is uh, hot. Yeah? It holds many promises, but uh, is also very difficult in the sense that the scientific basis for a lot of these promises is not yet there. Uh, the human beings are a bit difficult as study animals, so that, that's the reason for that. But nevertheless, we do see a future where the consumer is much better informed 
about just, just as simple as today, you have your, your motion sensor, you know how, how active you have been. So you can get data from, from lots of things telling you basically on, on what your needs are. Yeah? Um, I think that will further develop. And the only uh, caveat is that we need to watch out for very opportunistic entrepreneurs who basically start selling it today but can't live up to those uh, promises. So I think there will be a steady movement in the direction of. We are following that very closely, but we really want to keep very close to the consumer. And, and again, we don't have one particular consumer in mind. We basically are there for, for, for all that uh, want to buy our products. Uh, we do see that there is a very important distinction with respect to life stage, and I mentioned it before, and lifestyle. And the first step would be that personalization could mean that you really become sensitive and well-informed about what that means for your meal on a specific day. That people become much more conscious about, okay, I've been sporting, working out, things like that. Now there's no limit to the calories that I need, but the next day when you're only sedentary, you're sitting at the office, just watching a football game, then you need to lower your intake. That kind of realization to, to, to help consumer understand that and be informed about his own behavior in relation to that is very key. And of course, our products need to fit that, yes, obviously, yeah. I agree to that. There is not one consumer. There are, in our case, four million consumers. Uh, well, we have seen and noticed that uh, there is still an issue with uh, the quality of the data. I've said that before, but it's really an issue. If you want to go to personalized nutrition, it's important to have very good data. And for instance, when we launched uh, the Nutri-Score, uh, before that, we have been busy quite several months cleaning data from our own products, but also from all the, the products that we, we got from, from other suppliers. Uh, so I think there's still a lot to do there before we can really go into the uh, personalized nutrition. I'm going to ask you this. I, I want a really quick answer because I want to save a little bit at the end. I'm going to ask you to finish this sentence. I'm going to warn you so that you can panic for the next two minutes. The next generation of consumers are, that's how we're going to end. Meanwhile, how about minimizing packaging? Oh, it's an excellent idea. Mm. And, and we need to do we that. Do that yeah. And it's, it's a massive change that we are, and I, I'm no doubt uh, uh, Colride as well, is, is heavily engaged in. So we made public commitments to do that. And uh, uh, I was at a meeting in, in Brussels uh, last Friday where we are working towards a European pact. Huh? So, uh, it's absolutely important that we change that, that we help in, in those areas where we don't have collection systems, that we help set up those collection systems, preventing leakage into the environment. Mm -hmm. Terrible pictures of that. At the same time, it's, it's one of the top priorities in our business to do this, yes? Yeah. Absolutely. How do you feel about packaging? What we are dreaming about, and, and we're trying to do some experiments left and right as well, is um, also within the European context, is to find packaging that will indicate themselves whether the product is still good or not. That you don't need the data anymore. Mm. Uh, and you still give it more time for, for consumption. So I'm hoping in a couple of years from now we'll have that kind of packaging. Mm. Meta, is this even relevant for you? You're just dealing with whatever is no, it left is, over? No, it is a little bit. So we, mm. we encourage our consumers to bring their own packaging. But if they don't, then the partner store will have something sure. they can carry the food home in. All right. It's um, been an interesting discussion. Let's wrap it up with you concluding this sentence. <laughs> the next generation of consumers are Meta. Going to demand a lot more sustainable solutions. Next generation of consumers are Stefan. Are going to be more savvy and will be a lot better informed than we are today. This is a very positive approach. I like that. Next generation of consumers are, Rob? Well, they, they, well, uh, they choose with the planet in their minds. Mm. In mind. Yeah. You have a very positive, upbeat view of the next generation of consumers. <laughs> Meta, Stefan, Rob, thank you very much. Please thank your panel, everybody. Thank you. All right.